in order to make guilds money, and that's exactly what it was called. It was called guild. That's money, or guilders in the Netherlands. What used to be called, uh, the money of the Netherlands was called guilders, after guild. So in order to make guild money, called guilt or guilty, the private bar guilds normally oversee a unique hidden trust for each controversy or suit that comes into the private Roman court. Any bonds that are generated are called guilt bonds, are connected to the hidden trust which the private bar guild members are sworn to deny exists. Now, given we've spoken about this word guilt, it might be worth, in fact, going to a different article and then we can return to this because we mentioned the word guilt. I think it might be worth going to article 287 just quickly for a moment to get a handle on what we mean by guilt. Now, if you go to article 287 for a moment and have a look at the meaning of guilt, you find that the word guilty is actually an ancient commercial legal term. It's a commercial term associated with the private charter guilds from the 13th century, and it means literally a payment made in gold to a private guild or a debt or fine owed to the private guild. That's what guilty means. And as it mentions there, the official currency of the Kingdom of Netherlands up until the euro was called the Gilden in honour. If you look at the meaning under Canon 3146, you see that the, the origin of the word comes from 14th century English Dutch Gilder or from 13th century Venetian Italian Gilder, meaning guild payment in gold, debt or fine owed to the guild. The word itself comes from the 8th century Khazarian Magyar language, Kulta, literally meaning gold. And Kulta still means gold and Kilta still means guild in Finnish today. So we go, we'll, we'll continue on this because guilt is a key, key issue when we talk about the private bar guild. 3147, consistent with the ancient practice of the private chartered guilds of the Roman cult, a guild could lawfully detain a surety, a non-guild member who was guilty and therefore unable or unwilling to pay a debt or fine owed to the guild until the debt was paid. If the person had insufficient gold, guilt, to pay the guild, the guild could then issue a bond called a guilt bond against the flesh of surety and then sell it as a means of recovering the debt or fine owed to them. This is the origin of the bond. The bonds are built in. It's all the system is built in from day one. The only mystery is they hid the history. But the history is plain sight, open in plain sight. And this practice has continued for more than 700 years, unchallenged until now, with the private bar guild, one of the last surviving and fully functioning private charter guilds. Now, before we, we go back to presumption of the Roman cult, Roman court, let's have a look at 3148 and then we'll move on. When a non-guild member of the private bar guild is, is present in one of the guild buildings, dealing with the primary business of the bar being organised global profit from crime, that's, that's the purpose of the private bar guild, organised crime, the private bar guild members seek to force either a plea of guilty or not guilty. One, a plea of guilty in a building controlled by the private bar is equivalent to saying, I will pay as a tacit consent of liability for a debt or fine owed to the guild and is consent to the lawful detainment of the flesh of the accused as surety until the fine or debt is paid. And two, a plea of not guilty in a building controlled by the private bar guild is equivalent to saying, I refuse to pay. With the presumption of liability for a debt or fine owed to the guild, but belligerent refusal to pay, therefore permitting the lawful detainment of the flesh of the accused to surety. It's why they want you to plead guilty or not guilty. Not guilty does not mean innocent in their system. Now I'm going to flick back again 
to the previous canon that we were looking at, which was uh, article, article I should say, Article 299 of the Roman Court. And I wanted to cover that area of guilt before we got into the presumptions. So now we're going to back to Canon 3228 of Article 299 of Positive Law. And we're now going to walk through the 12 key presumptions that we face when we uh, receive anything from a private Roman court. I'm going to go through this carefully and consistently because this, I believe, I have never seen the presumptions laid out in a systematic way before. But here we go. A Roman court does not operate according to any true rule of law, but by presumptions of the law. Therefore, if presumptions presented by the private bar guild are not rebutted, they become fact and are therefore said to stand true. This is Canon 3228 of Article 299 of Positive Law on the site 1 hyphen heaven. Now, there are 12 key presumptions asserted by the private bar guild which, if unchallenged, stand true, being public record, public service, public oath, immunity, summons, custody, court of guardians, court of trustees, government as executor, beneficiary, executor de son tort, incompetence and guilt. Let's go through these now. One, the presumption of public record is that any matter brought before a lower Roman court, there's a spelling mistake there, is a matter for the public record, when in fact it is presumed by the members of the private bar guild that the matter is a private bar guild business matter. So, in other words, when you go to court, you assume that it is a court of record. It's not a court of record. Very few of their courts are courts of public record. Usually the highest courts of appeal, the Supreme Courts, and unless openly rebuked and rejected by stating clearly the matter is to be on the public record, the matter remains a private bar guild matter completely under private bar guild rules. So that's the first presumption that people make. The second presumption, two, the presumption of public service, is that all members of the private bar guild who have all sworn a solemn, secret, absolute oath to their guild, then act as public agents of the government or public officials by making additional oaths of public office that openly and deliberately contradict their private superior oaths to their own guild. So let's make that clear because this is a very important point here. The presumption of public service is that members of a secret occult guild who have sworn an absolute oath to that guild are legitimate public servants because they have taken a second oath, a lower oath, that contradicts their guild and therefore are public servants. So unless openly rebuked and rejected, the claim stands that these private bar guild members are in fact legitimate public servants and therefore trustees under public oath. That's the second presumption. Three, the presumption of public oath is that all members of the private bar guild acting in the capacity of public officials who have sworn a solemn public oath remain bound by that oath and therefore bound to serve honestly, impartially and fairly as dictated by their oath. Now, unless openly challenged and demanded, the presumption stands that the bar, private bar guild members have functioned under their public oath in contradiction to their guild oath. But if challenged, such individuals must recuse themselves as having a conflict of interest 
and cannot possibly stand under a public oath. You cannot serve two masters. This is why when the oath is demanded, the judges and magistrates go ballistic because their oath cannot stand. They cannot. If you drive home the death blow, are you also a member of a private legal association? Are you not a member of the bar association? Therefore, how can, how can your oath possibly stand? And if your public oath cannot possibly stand, how can you possibly be a public servant, a public trustee? You can't, which goes to the presumption of point four. They're all connected. Here we go, presumption point four. The presumption of immunity is that key members of the private bar guild in the capacity of, quote-unquote, public officials acting as judges, prosecutors, and magistrates who have sworn a solemn public oath in good faith are immune from personal claims of injury and liability. This is what they're hiding behind. This is why they go to work and are happily to take your home, your children, your livelihood, and sleep well at night after a bottle of red wine. Why? Because they claim immunity. Unless the presumption is openly challenged and the oath demanded, the presumption stands that the members of the private bar guild as public trustees, that's the source of their immunity, as public trustees, acting as judges, prosecutors, and magistrates are immune from any personal accountability for their actions. Take away their immunity and they will run for the hills. Fifth assumption. I'm sorry that these are fairly meaty, but I hope you appreciate the order of these and the disclosure of these are extremely important. So the presumption of summons, and we're going to talk about summons a bit more after this. The presumption of summons is that by custom, a summons unrebutted stands... And therefore, one who attends court is presumed to accept a position, defendant, juror, witness, and jurisdiction of the court. Attendance to court is usually invitation by summons. Unless the summons is rejected and returned with a copy of the rejection filed prior to choosing to visit or attend, jurisdiction and position as the accused and the existence of guilt stands. Now, with that, I think it is worthwhile going to Article 306, summons for a moment, and just looking at summons in a bit more detail. So I'm now going to click to Canon article, I should say, Article 306, where I'd like to go through with you some of the canons relating to summons. And the reason I want to go through this is because I've been asked many times how one should deal with summons and there's been many many different opinions on summons and I have to say I've never seen it as clearly as it needs to be in understanding what we mean by a summons so for those that have just come onto the call we're looking at aspects of positive law from one-heaven.org positive law and now article 306 summons before we return to the list of 12 key presumptions of Roman court. So under summons, what do we mean by summons? Well, Canon 3262. A summons is a formal writ of demand for someone to attend an official forum and event at a given time and day based on one or more presumptions that if not rebutted in writing before the day and time are presumed to stand true. The royal wedding invitation, and it was an invitation, actually was a summons. And if you go and have a look, go and have a look at the text of the royal wedding invitation, you'll see that it was a summons by the monarch. Now, Canon 3263. Why, why do we know that it's presumption? Because of the meaning of the word. The word summons was created in the 16th century from two Latin words, sumo, meaning to take up, to presume, assume, arrogate, or undertake to exact a punishment. And monere, meaning to remind, advise, warn, instruct, or foretell. So built into the word 
is is presumed 